Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's track on capital markets. My name is Daniel Sadhu, and I'm the APAC Head of Sales for Smart Karma, based in Singapore. I'm delighted to welcome Mohammed Nasser Ismail from SGX, who is going to introduce and kick off the capital markets track. Nasser is Senior Vice President, Global Head of Equity Capital Markets at the SGX. He is responsible for developing SGX's catalyst for fast-growing companies and spearheads other private fundraising platform initiatives. NASA is going to give us uh, a, and share with us a um, presentation, and then hopefully after the presentation, we'll have some time for Q&A. So without further ado, over to NASA. Uh, thank you, Daniel, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm pleased to be here on the um, Smart Karma's Insight 2020 um, to speak about the Singapore capital markets amidst the uh, COVID-19 global pandemic. So, so for today's presentation, I thought that we should take a stock take of where the Singapore capital markets is today. Uh, and then we will move towards looking at um, two events in the past, which could be instructive for us uh, in anticipating what may happen uh, in the future. Uh, and that is the uh, SARS outbreak as well as the global financial crisis to see what and how the capital markets behaved uh, during those periods. Um, and after that, I think we have built in some models uh, of various scenarios, um, a very basic one, uh, in anticipation of how the capital markets uh, can look like uh, depending on how things pan out going forward. And uh, I will then end my presentation briefly by talking about what SGX is doing uh, in order to help our various stakeholders cope with the present situation. If you look at the year-to-date performance of the Singapore capital markets, you will see that to date the STI index have uh, fallen to as low as 34% as its peak on 1st January uh, 2020. It has since uh, made a partial recovery to just under uh, 20% uh, of what it was in at the beginning of the year. Uh, this is in line with most of the other indices um, across various uh, countries in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, most have declined around 20%, although the decline uh, in the Singapore market, uh, as is typical during most downturns, is less volatile and less steep than the other markets. The declines in uh, most of the ASEAN markets as well as Asia-Pacific markets were a little bit more dramatic uh, at the peak of uh, uh, the recalibration across the Asia-Pacific region, but now uh, most have uh, leveled off at the minus 20% level. Um, the Singapore stocks, like I mentioned earlier on, were this volatile in the region over the past 12 months, uh, with a volatility of 22% as of end of March, and up from 10.7% at the end of December 2019. Um, just like other markets, in line with other markets, our security uh, daily average volume has increased uh, dramatically to 1.6 billion, which is a 58% increase year on year. The capital raising activities slowed down uh, quite significantly with a number of uh, sizable IPOs that were expected in the first quarter of this year being delayed as a result of the global and macro uncertainties. Uh, despite that, I think a credible number of uh, equity listing was achieved, raising a total of $479 million of funds uh, in the secondary market in particular. Uh, we had $702 million uh, of primary fund raising in the uh, primary market through five new equity listings. Uh, and if you were to look at uh, the past uh, scenarios, this is significant because secondary fundraising activities uh, on the SGX platforms have always been robust 
uh, both during times of uh, peace as well as uh, during times of global uncertainties as is the case today. Now, if we were to trace the what happened and what was the dynamics during the SARS crisis, which was a more compressed period of time that occurred between November 2002 uh, all the way right up to around 2005, uh, you would notice that the activities actually started to decline already sometime at the beginning of first quarter 2002 and second quarter 2002, the markets in Singapore were not going too great, uh, but it recovered at, in during the fourth quarter 2002. And when the SARS outbreak happened in November 2002, there was a delayed reaction and only uh, hit the market in the first quarter of 2003. When, uh, when the first case of SARS was identified in Singapore in March 2003. Um, fundraising activities dried up uh, and uh, was only helped by the substantial listing of SingPost, a Temasek linked company uh, in May 2003, raising 786 million Singapore dollars. Then between uh, the second quarter of 2003 all the way to fourth quarter of 2004, um, IPO market activities dried up uh, and most of the fundraising activities that was done on the Singapore market was done uh, through secondary fundraise. Um, so there was a period where uh, recovery was rather slow. Um, this culminated in the listing of Fortune Reed in August 2003, which raised $2, uh, $234 million. And really, the capital market activities uh, became normalized from fourth quarter 2004, and you could see that there was a big jump in the amount of second uh, amount of uh, funds raised during that period, as the market recovered and the uh, long lines of companies that were awaiting for that recovery uh, rushed to the door across the market all the way to the fourth quarter of 2005. The GFC was a more significant period of um, disruption in the capital markets, uh, which lasted uh, about three, three and a half years in total. Um, and it was uh, marked with a series of events that uh, caused a massive uncertainty uh, in the capital markets during that period. In Jan 2008, uh, the mortgage-backed securities crisis uh, in the US came to a hit with the Feds uh, intervening and slashing interest rate to support the mortgage-backed markets. Um, at that time, you could already see that there was a, a fall in the capital markets activities from first quarter 2008. Uh, and in March 2008, uh, Bear Stearns collapsed and was bought in by JP Morgan, uh, followed quickly in September by the Lehman crisis, as well as the bailout of uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, if you can see the fundraising activities during the first quarter of 2008 to third quarter of 2009, it, it completely dried up, uh, symptomatic of the credit crunch that happened then, uh, where access to capital and funding was very difficult for companies globally. October 2008 saw the collapse of the uh, financial sector in Iceland, as well as bank runs in the UK, as the US and Europe uh, proceeded towards going into a deep recession. Um, and then we had uh, a period where uh, we thought that we were out of the woods, which was in fourth quarter 2009, where activities uh, improved. Uh, and the companies in the market sought to recapitalize and strengthen their balance sheet. Um, but then 
the Europe debt crisis happened and that brought another long period of uncertainty, a few quarters of that uh, until the IMF decided to bail out uh, Greece. So all these series of activities uh, led to all sorts of uncertainties and in that period, uh, we still saw a credible number of listings, um, about 36 IPOs, raising $1.6 billion in total. Um, and 28 IPOs raised $3.2 billion in 2009. Uh, but primarily, the significant fundraising was done uh, through the listing of Capital Mall Asia in November 2009. Uh, and this again is a massive link company because it's from Capital Land uh, and it's another REIT. Uh, and they dominated the uh, fundraising activity on the Singapore market. If you were to look at the uh, fundraising uh, exercise during the global financial crisis, uh, the secondary fundraising aspects of the Singapore market were again uh, quite impressive as our regulatory uh, bodies uh, sought to uh, loosen the fundraising, uh, secondary fundraising um, regulation in order to enable more efficient and easier uh, fundraising activities on our markets, uh, leading to many companies, uh, particularly the Tomasic Link companies, to recapitalize and strengthen their balance sheet through secondary fundraising in the capital markets. So here are uh, some quick takeaways of the SARS and GFC uh, uh, period. SARS saw a dampened IPO market of about three quarters in 2003, but the recovery was quick as only Asian markets were impacted. Uh, SARS left the West largely untouched. Uh, and as we all know, the present crisis is quite different. COVID-19 is a global pandemic, uh, which uh, will more than likely, I think it's almost certain to extend beyond a short period of time uh, and will probably extend to the point where until either a vaccine is found or uh, if you're very lucky, the virus uh, dissipates. Um, the GFC, saw a longer period of uh, uncertainty, which was about two years. Uh, and there were multiple events that uh, caused concern and uncertainty around that. Uh, recovery was clearly slower as global markets were impacted. And it was also then um, succeeded by the European debt crisis, which uh, added on to the already stressed uh, financial situation across the world. Today, uh, if you were to look at the COVID-19 situation, again, we have a global situation, and I think it is, uh, um, um, it is one that touched all areas of the world. Um, and um, it is much worse than the global financial crisis, both in terms of scale, as well as the length of time that it might take uh, to recover. From the Singapore market's perspective, if you were to look at um, the capital markets activities during these periods of uncertainties, we have certain um, trends that we have observed in the past, which is that there will be a prevalence of a small cap listings. Uh, generally, uh, it will be $150 million a market cap and below. So the SME markets uh, will continue to get funded uh, because of the modest fundraising expectations um, in the during the SARS crisis, 90% of the listings were small or mid-cap companies uh, raising less than $50 million, uh, almost all of them. Whereas in the global financial crisis, 70% uh, of those companies were of that size. Uh, with 81% of them, again, a vast majority raising only uh, $50 million or less. Um, from a geographical standpoint, uh, most of those companies that were listed during the period of uncertainty uh, were from either uh, Singapore uh, or Greater China, uh, and a small sliver of companies would be from Southeast Asia. Um, so this tends to be a little bit more uh, less diverse than the uh, geographical distribution of companies that come to list on SGX in uh, times of that are more stable uh, than these. We also saw that 
during the SARS and the global financial crisis, uh, two significant uh, domestic link companies were listed uh, to reignite the capital markets. Uh, in during the SARS crisis, it was the Singpost, which happened in May two thousand and three. Uh, and during the global financial crisis, uh, Capital Mall Asia Limited was listed on November 2009, uh, raising a significant amount of uh, money, which is $2.8 billion. Uh, another sort of like a side valuation um, observation uh, relates to the important REITs sector on the Singapore market. REITs listing tend to be viable only with recovery uh, with, through the listing of Fortune REIT uh, in August 2003 and a very modest fundraise of 234 million at that time. Um, during the global financial crisis, there, were, there was a dearth of uh, REITs listing between 2008 and 2009. Uh, Cash Logistics Trust listed in April 2010 is a fundraise of 417 million but only after um, matters stabilize across the world. Now we built kind of like four basic scenarios uh, of what a recovery can look like um, during the present crisis. And the first two scenarios are on your screen, uh, which is a V scenario, a U scenario. A V-shaped scenario, which is increasing looking uh, less likely these days, uh, anticipates a recession that lasts uh, for six months um, and then the IPO market uh, will come back on track in the first quarter of 2021. This anticipates a deleterious effect on the balance sheets of companies uh, looking to list and therefore it only becomes viable for them to list uh, on the basis of a recovery that can be reflected uh, in their balance sheet in the second half of 2020. Um, we anticipate that the impact of COVID-19 would be more significant on the more vulnerable, smaller companies with less resources to withstand the uh, harsh realities of the um, pullback in economic activities uh, globally. <clears throat> But if we were to have, <coughs> excuse me, if we were to have a V-shaped recovery, then <coughs> the IPOs that are delayed by COVID-19 will come back online uh, in first quarter 2021. But we do expect that some of the less uh, robust uh, or more directly impacted companies with less robust balance sheet may fall out uh, and will take longer to come to market. In the second usage scenario, you, have, you will anticipate a recession of 12 months where the IPO market will come back on track in the third quarter of 2021. We will anticipate a prolonged low valuations, which will result in a flight in quality towards blue chip companies or, or more uh, well-known Singapore original companies. Uh, we expect the balance sheet to be impacted in the first half of 2021 and maybe uh, to some extent, the second half of 2021. Um, as with previous crisis, the smaller companies will come to market first. Uh, and there would be some significant negative impact on the IPO markets going forward. And I think that this um, impact uh, is not peculiar only to the Singapore market, for all the scenarios. For the uh, public markets, it would be the same more or less across the globe. Then we have the more um, frightening scenarios, which are the L and extended L scenario, which anticipate a global recession lasting for 24 to 60, uh, 36 months, where recovery will only happen in 2022, where you will see the collapse of many uh, companies, both in the public and private space, because of the economic shock. Uh, of the uh, global pandemic, uh, you can expect that the company's financials will be severely impacted and there might be some level of uh, liquidity crunch unless there are uh, interventions by the central banks. Um, we will not see uh, many larger listings uh, and REITs um, and only uh, companies in the defensive sectors or the winners of the 
uh, COVID-19 global pandemic, uh, will be a viable IPO candidates when recovery comes. Uh, we will speak about uh, some of uh, the sectors that we think will are winners uh, during this crisis and will remain viable later on. Uh, extended L merely anticipates a longer period of time uh, for the global recession, which extends beyond three years. And this can have a major um, impact, not only on the balance sheets of private companies, but also the impact on secondary fundraising, as well as the capital market ecosystem, as uh, market professionals will struggle to remain viable over extended period of time. And there may be industry consolidation in that area, leading, leading to a shrinkage in uh, investment banking activities uh, across the board. It makes for a very dire scenario if all these things will be severely impacted um, over a long period of time and will come back online perhaps only in 2023. Now, what is uh, SGX's attitude towards COVID-19 uh, and how are we helping uh, our constituents cope uh, during this period? Certainly, SGX as a platform, uh, we have obviously no control over the macro and how things will unfold in the future. Uh, but certain um, elements of this crisis um, do present challenges for our listed companies, uh, both in terms of getting themselves prepared for the necessary disclosures, as well as the constraints of uh, physical limitation in getting some of these things done as uh, economies around the world go into lockdown. So SGX has uh, provided a care package uh, very early on in the crisis uh, to encourage virtual AGMs by subsidizing uh, $5,000 to every listed company listed on SGX um, to conduct virtual AGMs for shareholders, making sure that investors uh, um, remain accessible to information from uh, the companies. In addition, there was also a one and a half million contribution to the National Healthcare Support Programs called the Courage Fund um, in support of our frontline healthcare workers as they fight to overcome the global pandemic. Um, we have taken uh, several measures on the regulatory front, which is probably the only uh, aspect of uh, this thing that is within the control of SGX, which is regulation. Um, and the regulatory uh, dispensations that were given uh, included the automatic 68-day extension for issuers to hold AGMs, as well as an auto extension for the release of unaudited financial results for February and April 2020, uh, in recognition of the physical constraints uh, imposed by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, most, most significantly, I feel, was the relaxation on uh, fundraising limits uh, for main board issuers, the enhanced uh, share issue limit um, is significant uh, as it enables uh, main board issuers to raise money uh, from the market in the secondary fundraising uh, up to 100% of its share capital versus the limit of 50% previously. And we do anticipate that uh, listed companies will take advantage of this uh, regulatory dispensation to strengthen and recapitalize their balance sheet uh, in anticipation of a prolonged period of uncertainty uh, due to the COVID-19 uh, situation. In addition to that, the, we also took the opportunity to uh, engage in certain hygiene uh, initiatives, um, such as the suspension of the financial watch list uh, so that um, issuers do not feel a pressure of being removed uh, through mandatory delistings uh, as a result of uh, this period of uh, global uncertainty and financial impact uh, on individual companies. And uh, this is uh, my last slide and basically uh, these are the businesses that we think uh, will be interesting uh, and are winners in the global financial crisis. First are those that can push domestic supply production 
uh, in recognition of the global disruption to supply uh, global supply chains. Um, there is more reliance on uh, domestic production. In Singapore, it's the uh, governmental push for 3030, which is by 2030 to have uh, the ability to produce 30% of our uh, food uh, and supply needs. Um, so there are a bunch of companies now, uh, um, both in Singapore and across the region, that are focused on uh, aquaculture, agri-tech, that uh, can help in uh, shortening the supply chains, uh, as well as uh, increasing sales sustainability uh, to ensure food security in Singapore. Um, we also think that in the consumer sector, um, companies in the education um, arena and mass market F&B will continue to be uh, viable in the IPO market. For healthcare, uh, clear winners are diagnostic companies uh, as well as uh, equipment suppliers and device makers. Uh, we can already see the performance of some of these companies uh, in our market, uh, getting a lot of invested interest, uh, and this will continue. Uh, we think that the healthcare device uh, makers as well as diagnostic makers uh, and any uh, solutions that can uh, strengthen our resistance to uh, the virus uh, will get um, uh, attention of investors going forward. Um, but the big winner is technology uh, in cybersecurity enterprise solution, uh, any SaaS model, uh, IoT, gaming, media, ad tech, any uh, tech solution that uh, enables the overcoming of um, of uh, the physical constraints uh, imposed by the COVID-19 and promotes connectivity in a contactless world uh, is a winner. Um, and we have seen uh, some of them uh, grown exponentially during this period. So that brings me uh, very nicely uh, to the end of uh, my presentation. And uh, I'll be happy to take uh, questions. Thanks, Nasser, for that presentation. I, I think, I believe we're actually out of time. Um, right. Well, maybe I can take just one question. So that okay, this, this, can... this was a really short question. You can answer really short. What shape yeah. of recovery do you anticipate in the IPO market and XGX? You, you gave various scenarios. So in one letter, what do you expect? I, I think it'll be a U shape. U, okay. Uh, uh, no second problem. one, okay. this could be answered very quickly. Do you expect a W scenario as another possibility? Yes or no? It's possible, but who knows? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think that we'll have to leave it there because you know the next presentation is starting. So um, this wraps up um, this session. I'd like to thank NASA from SGX for his very insightful presentation and for all participants attending the session. Um, on that, um, thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye.